softball, then you are going to love the Fast Pitch TV show. We're bringing you more interviews, more videos, and more product reviews than anyone else on the planet. Sit back and get ready. Here's the Fast Pitch TV show. Hello, I'm your host, Gary Leland, and this is the Fast Pitch TV show. Now, I try to bring you a new episode of this show every week. Try is the key word there, okay? Just check out my website every Friday at www.fastpitch.tv. Now, this is the home of the Fast Pitch TV network and the place to find all my softball, Fast Pitch softball videos and my Fast Pitch softball blogs. It's, it's basically a network for Fast Pitch Softball Media. So please, take a look after you finish watching this episode and see what you think for yourself. Now some of our most popular shows for the last two years have been from Softball Con in Louisville, Kentucky. If you're not familiar with Softball Con, you really need to check out their website. Just go to softballcon.net. Uh, right now they're getting ready for this upcoming year's events and you'll be to see who's, come, who's going to be there this year. Now, uh, this week, we're going to bring you part, the third part, the third and final part, should I say, of a session with Bill Hillhouse. Now, Bill is a great pitching coach, and he's a great guy. I really like Bill. If you've not seen part one or part two of this session, though, you may want to go watch episode 223 and watch episode 224 first, and then watch this part, okay? So let's start with session three right after this message. simplified it that much. When, when you talk about drills, how many times, like how many reps of a drill do you It depends. Do you it depends. Um, when working with kids in general, your rule of thumb, those of you who are parents will probably understand this, your rule of thumb is you get one minute of attention span per year of age. So after, if you got a 12 year old, after 12 minutes, she's starting to think about what's on Lee tonight and <coughs> Did Susie text her what the boy said to her at the hall? She, focus gets lost. So, what I always do is every 10 minutes, depending on the age, whatever it might be, I make them take a drink. You have them take a 90 second drink break, she comes back, you're gonna get a much more solid 15 minutes or 12 minutes, whatever it might be, than you would if you pushed her for too much time. So how, many, how much drills is too much? How much pitching is too much? Here's how I answer that question. When I was their age, when I was 12 years old, I pitched every single day. Every day that I could, multiple times if my brother would catch one. I did every single day. Now that was me, that's what I wanted to do. I was hungry for it and that's, that's all I ever wanted to do is play softball. And so, that's what I did. If you set a goal for her saying, listen, we're gonna throw 400 pitches in this session and her heart's just not in it that day. You know, she got in a fight with her boyfriend or whatever, then you just, you're just you gonna waste 400 pitches. You could waste 400 pitches. And if her mind starts flaking off and she's not thinking at, at the last 100, then you're just wasting 100 pitches. And you're wasting your time, you're wait, and you're potentially setting up bad muscle memory. So it varies, kid to kid, day to day. How much do you do? If they wanna do it every day, I would say absolutely let them. In some way, shape, or form, let them. Let them practice 10 minutes a day throwing socks into the mirror, dragging their foot up, snapping the ball into their glove or they can work on the elbow snap, something. There's something that a pitcher can do every single day to help themselves get better. So it really, you know, it's a loaded question to say how much do you do because every kid's different. There's some kids, we've all seen them. Everybody here is a coach or has seen a game. So everybody has seen the kid who's there because mom or dad wants them to be there. And I get, I get pitchers that come in and they, they're there because mom and dad wants them to be there, not because they want to be there. So you're only going to get out of that kid what they, this is like a bank, you're only going to get out of it what you put into it. So if they're not practicing in between and they're doing the, they're just going through the motions, it's, it's, 
best pitching coach in the world can't make a pitcher out of that. They got to want to do it. I wanted to do it. A lot of kids don't. They're a lot more interested. A lot more things for them to be doing. It's a different world. So, you had a question, sir? I'd just like to hear your opinion on the knuckle change. Well, the knuckle change is hard to take speed off without slowing down. So, most pitchers that throw a knuckle change do so with a, with a stop in their hand in some form or another, so they, they've changed their motion in order to reduce the speed. Um, I, I've seen very, very few kids that can do it without slowing themselves down. The other thing you gotta remember is that we wanna make sure that she's not able to get picked so that some coach isn't looking into her glove. And again, going back to it, if I'm not concealing the ball from the third base coach, and I'm doing this, or I'm doing this, they can see that that's a pretty obvious that that's gonna be a changeup. So, you know, I, if all things being equal and she's not slowing herself down and she's hiding the ball from everybody and nobody can see what group she's got on it, then I revert back to what I said in the beginning. Any way she can throw a changeup without slowing herself down is a good changeup. So, you know, one isn't right, one isn't wrong. It's just what works for that kid on that particular pitch. The rise ball, there's correct spin. Drop ball, correct spin. Curve ball, even there's correct spin. There's no hard, fast rule on the changeup other than you don't slow yourself down. More questions? Yes, sir. Typically, your coaches or pitching coaches will tell you that the first pitch that they should learn is the fastball um, and, and then the changeup. What's your idea or thought on progressing the progression of learning pitches? Well, um, I'll start them off on the draw and or basketball. And um, but where I'm a little where I'm a little bit different is I tell them though we're learning a drop. We're learning a drop. I don't say we're learning a basketball. We're learning a drop. And where my students run into problems is they go to their high school coach and their high school coach says, well, how many pitches do you throw? And she says, I throw three. I throw a rise, a drop, and a change. Oh, but you don't have a you don't have a screwball. You don't have a fastball. No. So they, in those cases, I say, okay, look, just tell them you have a fastball, throw your drop, they're never gonna know the difference anyway. If you're doing it right, the ball's gonna move, so what's the difference? Okay, and then they, and then if they want a screwball, or we work on the finger pressure one and make it cut in, so. Um, the progression of the pitch is different from kid to kid, but that's the general sequence, is that you go drop ball, change up, and then rise ball. And, I'm a little bit different from a lot of people because I will start to introduce the rise ball at a much younger age than a lot of people do. Even if it's just getting her working on the spin of the fingers where she's <clears> twisting the ball with the fingers, I'll get her working on it. And the reason I start to introduce it to them at a younger age than a lot of people is because I want to illustrate to them and make them understand why everything that we've talked about up to this point becomes important. And if you're cheating on one thing, you can cheat on a changeup, you can cheat on a drop ball, you cannot cheat on a rise ball and still expect to get the right spin. So all of a sudden that really hits home with them when they start when they start to try the double ball and they can't make the ball spin backwards. And I'm saying to them, listen, it's because your hand is stiff as a board here. You're, you're pitching like Frankenstein. You have your elbow and the ball coming down at the exact same time. You've got no lead of your elbow coming through like we've talked about. This is why all of these things come full circle on the rise ball. And so I start to introduce it to them at a younger age, even if they're not pitching in full motion, because I want them to understand why everything we've done up to that point is so important. So, you know, every coach has their ideas though, their own idea as to which progression to start teaching. And, and the, you know, the girls that claim to have nine pitches, but they all spin the exact same way, those, those are the ones that, you know, they come to you and, they, and I say, how many pitches do you have? And you say, well, I have eight. You have eight pitches? <coughs> yeah, eight pitches. And they go through the whole list of them. They got this one. They got the rising screw change, and they got the, 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 the back door change up curveball slider. And then they've got this one and that one. And I always say to them, well, your catcher's only got five fingers. What do you do then? They don't know what to say when I say that. And I say, listen, I throw three pitches. I throw a rise, a drop, and a change up. And when you get those three, then you can start to tinker with making the ball go side to side. But we don't want to make it go side to side without making it go up or down. And when you explain the logic to them, even the younger ones don't totally get it, but the parents will start to understand that. Yeah, that's the plane in which she's swinging the bat. 
I mean, everything that they're doing, they're taught robot swings from hitting off the machines and off the tees, and they're swinging with these planes. If that ball isn't changing planes, then we've got a serious problem. And the, the numbers are reflecting that, I said, in the College World Series. Look at how many home runs these people are hitting now. In the College World Series, women's softball College World Series, girls are hitting 25, 26 home runs. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And a lot of it is on, is on these pitches that don't work, that people think they do. So, three pitches, very eight to three. I vary eight to three. There was a, an article not too long ago where Mike Candrea came out and he said that exact same thing. A pitcher primarily only needs three pitches to succeed. The rise and drop. He specified the rise and drop and change. There's a, there's a really good message board if you guys are interested in that sort of stuff. And I go onto it when I'm in airports and stuff. And, and it's, it's, it's really, it's called discussfastpitch.com. And those of you guys, some of you may have heard of it before. Um, it's probably the best message board forum out there for all things softball. There's hitting forums, there's pitching forums, fielding forums, and you know, um, in this area, uh, well, most of you have probably heard of Howard Carrier, the hitting coach. He posts on there a lot. There's, there's a lot of pretty knowledgeable people that post on there. There's a lot of idiots too, but there's, there's a lot of knowledgeable people, and so you, that's a really good one. If you guys are really interested in that sort of stuff and you like to, to read as much info on pitching, whether you agree with it or you disagree with it, discussfastpitch.com is, is really a good one. Rise ball, ball. Throw it? No. What do you have them doing? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, just like in any other, any other pitch, when learning it, it becomes incredibly difficult. And they, you see a lot of girls, they get very, very frustrated with trying to learn the rise ball because they, they, it becomes a reality to them that what their motion is doing is disallowing them to even make the ball spin backwards. So a lot of times when they're learning it, they have to kind of do it backwards a little bit where they start this way. And then they go up a little bit higher. And then they go circle. They can't just go zero to 60. They gotta break it down. And if you're a dad and you've never pitched before, have patience. Don't get mad at them. I've seen so many family feuds where dad gets mad and he just can't understand why Sally can't make that ball spin backwards. And so I'll say, you know what, dad, here, you throw it to her. You show her how to do it. <laughs> then all of a sudden they understand why everything, you know, it, it isn't easy to do. It's very hard to do. And so try it yourself. That's, you know, that's one of the best advices I can give to you guys for, for anything, is go out and try to pitch yourself. Pitch up against a brick wall, pitch up against a chain link fence, take a bucket of balls, pitch, see what feels natural to you, and then you'll kind of see what I'm talking about with the motion. And then when you're learning the pitches, learn them along with your pitcher as well. Work on the spin so that you can help her to identify the right spins. But with the double ball, they really need to be doing little by little so that they can get the feel of it. And then they can go higher with it, and then they can go in the circle with it. I really wouldn't have them do full motion with it, just kind of keep it half motion, sideways circle type thing. Full motion is, now we're back to throwing, this is double the weight of a regular ball, because you got two balls. So now we're kind of going into that whole heavy ball type thing again. And that, that can lead to some problems later. So I specifically, when it comes to this, is I only have them do the K and then the sideways circle with the rise. I don't have them do full motion. So. Did that answer your question? Yes. I have a question back here. Maybe you mentioned this in the last session now, but you just said something about the heavy ball thing. Mm -hmm. Are you against working with, uh, with pitches with a weighted ball? I think it can, it can become problematic for them. Um, and I, like I said in the last session, it's not so much about the injury thing that I worry about, is I worry about the muscle memory aspect of it. That when a pitcher starts throwing with a heavy ball, what you see a lot of them start to do after about the fourth, fifth, sixth pitch is they start laboring and going, they don't have the fast arm circle. And so I want them to have that fast arm circle because if they don't, that can really start to lead to the crow hopping. Crow hopping as we went over, for those who weren't here in the last session, we talked about crow hopping a little bit. And one of the things I said was, crow hopping is a problem with the hands, it's not a problem with the feet. Every pitcher that crow hops has a hitch in their arm circle. Everybody's hitch is at a different spot. Somebody might hitch at 12 o'clock, somebody might hitch at 9 o'clock. The hitch is there though, if you watch it. Everybody that crow hops has a hitch. 
Kat Osterman leaps. She does not crow. She does not have a hitch in her arm circle. She goes airborne, but it's not because she's stopping and pausing her hand. So a lot of times with the weight of balls, you'll see that as they start to labor through it. And then they're almost making two different motions. They're going, and then here. In reality, your motion is going to be two different halves. First half of the motion, you go uphill. Second half, you come downhill. So the second half of your motion is always going to be faster than your first half, but you don't want to be make, making the muscle be the difference between the two, where you're muscling it in for the pitch. So when she's pitching and she's doing her warm-up drills, the higher she goes up, she can work on... Okay. The higher she goes up when she's doing the circles or she's doing the up-downs, higher she goes up, the more she can work on pulling herself down into her catcher. She'll gain more momentum. She'll start to get more velocity by just coming downhill towards her catcher a little bit harder. And it's going to help her get up on her toe versus dragging heavy on the side of the foot. And again, dragging heavy on the side of the foot, that's where these things come into play as well. This it really encourages them to push on straight forward. This is a great tool. Make one, a lot of people make them on a two by fours too. Just hang right do a U shape. But uh, I know what I talk about um, and, and have discussed is in a lot of cases very radically different from what you guys probably have been told about pitching up till now. I would really just uh, welcome you guys to try it yourself sometime, go out and practice up against the wall, up against the fence, see what feels natural to you. I promise you that this is not natural to you. And I can also promise you that when you're doing this, you're not going to put backspin on the ball for a rival. It's not my rule. I didn't invent it. Yes, sir. I've had my daughter was taught at a young age like that. You know, I've tried. You know, you help her, you want to be able to do it. And when I try that, it makes me square my body up Absolutely. way too early. Absolutely. It's that all and it's, it's all related in terms of most pitchers that do this square up and they come too fast and they go around their hip and they close the door or whatever they call it. And so, you know, the, the fix is, is to be done slowly where she throws the ball into her glove, where she can work on snapping her elbow, drag her toe on a piece of tape. If your foot goes off that tape like you were just demonstrating there, you're going to be able to see it. So if she's doing it in a mirror and she's dragging herself straight up, um, you know, you're, you're not going to be as inclined to go off the, the mark. So. Do you need a softball bat? Do you want to save $30? Softballjunk.com is offering an additional $30 discount off the price of all non-sale softball bats on their website. That's right, $30. So the next time you buy a bat, go to softballjunk.com and enter the code FPTV30 during checkout. And wham! You just put a cool $30 in your pocket. Welcome back. Now that last short clip, that's my daughter Amanda. And she was telling you about my online softball store, softballjunk.com. I hope you wrote down the code number she gave you. If not, you may want to rewind this show and go back and get it and write it down and keep it somewhere where you won't lose it. Reason is, anytime you buy a softball bat on my website, softballjunk.com, if you enter that code at the checkout, you'll save yourself $30 on a softball bat. And you can use that code over and over and over and over. It's basically good almost forever. So if you buy a new bat twice a year, that's 60 bucks a year almost forever. You just need to remember the code, so write that down. I hope you enjoyed the third and final part of Bill's clinic. Yeah, I, it was a great clinic. Bill's a great guy. Now, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you need to look at all the apps today that I've created. At this time, I've created eight different apps for the iPhone and the iPad. And you can find all of them at app.fastpitch.tv. Don't forget to check out our new college exposure show at www.collegesoftballexposure.com. It's a great way for high school players to get noticed by college coaches, and it's free. I mean, it doesn't cost you anything. So that's all for today. So until next week, this is your host, Gary Leland, saying goodbye, and thanks for watching. This show is a member of the Fast Pitch TV network. See all our shows and blogs at www.fastpitch.tv.